All right, guys, thank you all so much for coming out today. And today what we're going to do is we're going to break down Mobile Bay. When we first get down here, we're trying to figure out, and by Mobile Bay, I mean Mobile Bay and the Mississippi Sound because we share a common current, right? So we'll show, I'll show you some stuff here in a minute that's called a slanting downcast. It shows us how that current moves through Mobile Bay and the Sound, okay? So this is more of our same sort of water. When we're over here and we're in the uh, Perdido Bay area, Wolf Bay area, that's a different fishery. I mean, it really is. There's some things that are similar, some things that are different, but by and large, I consider it to be a different fishery. Fish in the Mississippi Sound and fish in Mobile Bay are gonna be the same style of fishing for the most part. So what I'm gonna concentrate on is Mobile Bay down through Mississippi Sound. Okay. And what we're going to look at today, we're not going to look at spots to go to per se. What we're going to instead concentrate on is how do I figure out where not to go? Okay, You know that old saying, 90% of the fish live in 10% of the water? Well, Mobile Bay could not be truer than that, I don't believe. Okay, I mean, you could spend all day, this is why I don't worry about teaching people a spot, because you could go, let's say we all went fishing together. And we had a wonderful day in that spot, wherever that spot was. And you went fishing every day there for a month. Five days would be gangbusters. Ten days would be okay. The other ten days you're wondering, I mean, is this the same place? Did I get lost? And the next few days after that you're going, why, why am I even doing this? Who am I as a person at that point? Because that's how it just changes. So much goes into it. But there's some basic things we can look at to help us understand where to go, what not to go. And what we have to understand is our waters in Mobile Bay have three things, three indicators that are going to help us as a rule of thumb figure out where to go. Is it 100% correct? No, it's rule of thumb. It gives us a good guideline where to start with, okay? So there's three things we want to go with, okay? So I call it the Holy Trinity. of water. All right, so just so you know, the Holy Trinity isn't just onion, bell pepper, and celery. Okay, so it's more than just gumbo. <coughs> right? The first thing we want to look at is salinity. Okay? That's how much salt we have in the water. If I didn't spell it right, I'm sorry. We're going to work with it. Though. Okay? That's how much salt we have in the water. And I'm going to show you in a minute what to look for. The next thing we want to look at is how much dissolved oxygen is in the water. And here on the Eastern Shore, we have to be extremely aware of that because we have what we call jubilee. So out of nowhere, the, the oxygen level drops through the bottom. Okay? Now, some fish like redfish are very tolerant of lower oxygen uh, in the water. But the thing about it is the bait fish aren't. And redfish, speckled trout, finder, all these fish, they, they will stay in the general area, but they're going to go to where the fish are. They're going to follow the bait fish. That's all they're doing. Okay. So when we look at Mobile Bay, can you go back to that other one, Matt? When you look at Mobile Bay, don't think of it, yeah, we can definitely think of it somewhat like there's some structure, we're going to see fish around, there's all that kind of stuff. But think of it instead more of like a large savanna area. Okay. So just like when you watch Richard Attenborough and he's talking about the lines are facing the gazelles across the savanna today, it's the same basic idea. Same basic idea. This is especially true for speckled trout. Very first, a little bit more stationary. So, got number two, oxygen. And number three, this doesn't really benefit the fish, this benefits us, is turbidity. Turbidity is how much particulates are in the water. In other words, how nasty it is. Okay? I would like to say that during the fall and the winter in Mobile Bay, there's always clean water to fish. Not everywhere is going to be clean, but there's going to be pockets of it, and there's reasons we'll find those pockets here in a minute. So number three is turbidity. All right. Now if you go over to that Slendy Nowcast section, that would be awesome. And guys, thank you all so much. That's Zach with Bayfly Charters. He's been super helpful for everything here at the store. And when I'm on the road, Zach will be the guy that will take care of you. He's a wonderful caster and a great friend. All right. Hey, man. Um, on the caster part. No, he's got the player. He's got a caster. Um, all right, so slinging so down cast. Yeah, can you zoom in on that a little bit? I can. Yay. Beautiful. Okay, so this is where we're at right here. This is where we're at in Daphne right this minute. 
Okay? So if you guys are familiar with this, you guys probably drove over this to get here today. You guys drove over I-10, unless you're going from the other way, then that's fine too. But if you ever drove over the Bayway, this is what we're looking at right here, okay? This is Dog River, this is Galliard Island, that's Weeks Bay, that's Bon Secure, that's Fort Morgan, whole nine yards. And if you look at it, we have a chart here showing us the salinity of where we're at, okay? Now this is the salinity at the surface level, okay? So what I want to stress is, here's what we want to look for. Now I want you guys to be mindful that we're looking at this from a site fishing perspective. So water, our bay water, if we get six, seven feet down, where it only seems like there's fresh water, there's salt down there. And we can throw sinking lines and be very effective throwing streamers and getting onto those fish. But we're gonna concentrate right now on finding places to sight fish, okay? So we gotta be mindful of that first three feet of the water level, okay? So that's what we're gonna look at as far as our salinity goes, okay? All right, now, next up. So as we come down here and we're looking at that scale, when I start to look at where do I want to basically fish that day, I want to first start with my turbidity. I like to have at least 18 parts per square unit. And up. 18 and up. So what's that going to tell me about right now where I want to be at? All this in Mississippi sounds looking lovely. West End of Dolphin Island is looking lovely. Um, down here around Fort Morgan, Bon Secure, up even. But as you notice, as we get into this blue area in the Weeks Bay, it's just not quite there yet. Will it get there later as the summer goes on, as fall gets on, and we get drier and drier conditions up north? Yes, 100%. But we just had some rain come through not too long ago. And guess what? Now it's coming in here. And Weeks Bay is getting fresher. This is getting water from Magnolia River and Fisher. So that changes what's going to happen. And you'll notice the same thing around here. Okay? So, ballpark idea, right now, Mississippi Sound, West End Off Island, right around here, around Boston Secure, looking fine. And this is a timeline. So if you go on here, we're going to have all the links to it so you can see what's going on. Watch this. You see how that is pushing down? You see how the currents are pushing in through here? We can start to see at tide changes what's going on, when is that salinity pushing through, and how do we need to understand that flow of bait fish. Now here's something that's pretty cool. We just had the Triple Tail Classic, which is uh, from all accounts a super great event. One thing that we can look for when we're looking for Triple Tail is we can look for that tide line because that's where the majority of stuff that they carry uh, where Triple Tail like to hide. And using the salinity now cast, we can forecast about where that tide line is going to be. So that's another useful thing you can do, not just red fish. Okay? Next up, dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen, I want to see at least 80% or better. Okay? Again, that goes back into what we're talking about. Are redfish tolerant to lower uh, oxygenated water? 100%. But are the bait fish? Not so much. They don't want to be in that mess. Zach, would you go to the DISL? I will. Beautiful. Alright, so this is Sunday now cast. This is through NOAA. So you guys can check this out. Watch that forecast. Falling earth. And this is going to give you a good idea of where to go. So this is the Arco. So scroll down. This is through Dolphin Island Sea Lab, guys. Beautiful. Okay, and right here, that is our buoy data. Okay, all of these little spots right here are going to tell us all kinds of amazing information about the water that's being sampled. Sometimes it's only atmospheric, sometimes it's water and atmospheric. Zach, would you click on right there, which I believe is Bon Secure? Beautiful. So we're going to scroll down Bon Secure Station and let's check it out. Come on, come on up back up this way, buddy. Perfect. Now look. Dissolved oxygen, 82. That is awesome. Water temp, 121, I believe it. A million and ten. If it said 600 degrees, I would have believed it today. Okay? Now remember, it is, it is a uh, buoy, and some things are a little bit foggy. But in general, you can get a rough idea. Take a look. I still believe 121. I don't believe that. Okay. Dissolved oxygen right here, 82%. So we do have good dissolved oxygen right there in Bon Secure. Salinity 13. Are there still redfish there? Yes. Is there a high concentration of bait fish? Not generally, but that's not always a rule. Okay? Right? Now, turbidity 9.4. We're getting there. What do we need to look at as far as turbidity? At what level, when you're searching this, can you say, okay, I can see through the water and be effective at sight fishing in Mobile Bay? It's 
five parts per square unit in Hill. So right here, if we were in Bon Secure, we would have trouble seeing fish. So this probably only is about six to nine inches of visibility. Okay, so we're gonna do 80% and up. And we wanna do five and down. All right, Zach, can we go back out real quick? Or you can click right here. Uh, let's go to, do, 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 do. Uh, can you see Katrina Point on there? Or Katrina Cut? There it is, beautiful, right there. Yay! All right, so now we're gonna check Katrina Cut. All right, let's check it out. Water temperature, 88.3. One thing I do want to point out right now this time of year, the closer we get to the Gulf of Mexico, the closer we are to that moderating presence of that deep water in the Gulf. So this time of year, in the heat of summer, the further we get towards the Gulf, the more successful we're going to be. This is why I was so happy when Sam came out, because if we're fishing the beach, we're as close to that as we can be. If we're trying to get out of the skiff, or we're trying to figure out where to go, this means that places like the Barrier Islands, like Eddie Boy, Horn, Ship, Dolphin Island, are going to be much more productive because we're close to that moderating influence of the Gulf. Next thing, dissolved oxygen. Salinity, 30. Sweet. Perfectly good salty water. Dissolved oxygen, 97.6. Tons of bait fish out there right now. Turbidity, 6.9. Oh, so close, man. Which means that a tide change could honestly, next tide change, could be all we need. And that's nice and clear. So we're getting really close on that. So kind of take a look at that. Next up, would you please pull up, uh, just go go out to where you give me the data. Just hit, hit the back this of This is not just a NOAA buoy information. This is a different. This map. is DI, this is Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Oh. So this is the ARCO system from Dolphin Island Sea Lab. So you can pull this up on your cell phone when you're on the boat, or you can pull it up before you go. This is all super useful stuff, beautiful. Would you click right there? That's Heron Bayou. Which one? Oh. Right there, you're right around Heron Bayou, right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep working our way west. By all means, go in here and click around, click every buoy until you see where you want to go. Yeah, let's do it. Sorry, I pulled up a new tab. That's oh, okay. It will pull up a new tab. Just click on that new tab. And that, okay, cool. Perfect, scroll down. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, up a little bit. Uh, that one right there. Grand Bay here in Bayou, right there. This one right here. Yep, that's the one. All right, so this is Grand Bay here in Bayou. This is the estuary system. So if you guys ever want to go fish that little area, the Mississippi, Alabama line right there. And this is going to be indicative of uh, Viola Battery area from like Isla Herb west towards Bain's Point. Okay. Is it all encompassing? No, because winds and everything are going to change what we see. But it's a good indicator. So remember, all of this is a good indicator to help you guys figure out how to separate large sections of water. Okay? All right, so let's take a look real quick. Turbidity 10. It's a little bit rough. Remember, we talked about getting close to that moderating influence of the Gulf this time of year. Also, too, we've had some pretty decent winds. Okay. In the Mississippi Sound, we have a lot of very fine silt. It doesn't take very much in the way of wave action to cloud that whole thing up. So keep that in mind. All right, salinity, 25, loving it. Dissolved oxygen, really low in the bayou right now, 34.9. You see what I'm saying? That water starts to stagnate because of the heat. Colder water always has higher levels of oxygen. Okay. When Sam was talking about why he likes that little bit of wave action, not only does it help disguise your fly turn at the bottom, that wave action produces higher oxygen levels, and that helps tremendously. Tremendously. Sweet. All right. So, what's our rule? Salinity, eight, 18 parts and up. Oxygen level, 80% and up. Turbidity, 5 parts per square unit and down. Okay? Do that 3, 4, 5, you're golden. Okay? And we're going to get into a time of year coming up pretty directly. As soon as we start to get those cooler nights, we're going to have a lot less algae bloom. A lot of this turbidity we're seeing right now is not only sand and silt, it's also algae. Okay? So as soon as we get those first kind of cool nights, it's going to die. And then what's going to happen is your oxygen levels are also going to drop too because it's sucking the oxygen out of the water producing CO2. So give it a little while, let that clear up, keep an eye on it, and then boom, oxygen levels are going to pick up, turbidity is going to drop. 
Okay, so we're coming into that transitional stage right now. If I had to go anywhere right now that I want to go fishing, I would look personally as a general area, Fort Morgan, even though it didn't say that the salinity was where I wanted it, it's going to be. West End of Dolphin Island, Betty Boy, Horn, Ship, all those are going to be good little areas down through there. Okay. Next up, is that good? Pull up the satellite imagery next. So another thing you guys have is NASA World View. NASA World View is going to let you look at a satellite image from the day before. Okay. So remember, it's not that perfect, but ain't too bad. So if you're new to the area and you haven't developed that network like um, Captain Ben was talking about, or if you're a terrible jerk like myself, okay, and nobody likes you, then you need to have these good tools, okay? Or own a fly shop, either one's fine. Actually, don't own a fly shop, that's my job. All right, cool. So right here, this is taken a couple days ago. Each one of those is a day in the month, but we can look and see, so that's the 14th. You see how Zach's moving that on down? So we can see just a couple days ago, you see how it was getting clearer down here in the Mississippi part of the sound on the outside of the bayou? Looking pretty decent here on the tip of Fort Morgan. Look right there on the beach, that is clear as a bell. And you can also see too how that we've had winds pushing this way. You see how the front side of Dolphin Island and the front side of Petty Boy have been protected from that silt. Okay? So this helps us kind of eliminate where we need to go. This, again, I'm going to stress this, this time of year in the summer doesn't favor a waiting angler if they want to go out and spot fish redfish. We get in the fall, algae levels drop, then you can go places like Fort Morgan over here, backside, west end of Dolphin Island, a beautiful place to get on the backside of the beach and wait and look for redfish. Wonderful places to go. Really good for a waiting angler to get out there and go enjoy that. Do remember to do the Stingray Shuffle, okay, and you'll be in good shape. Dude, what month is, you said? Uh, September, October, yeah. November, okay. all the way through. I like February eventually gets those really cold days. It kind of shuts down the really shallow parts of the marsh. And we'll do a winter seminar before we get into that, talking about how to beat that extreme cold. Okay. All right, next up, can you pre uh, go to that wind finder? Beautiful. And we're going to put links to this on the YouTube channel, on the YouTube uh, video, so you can see every single one of these links. This is our wind finder. This shows us what direction the wind is going to. You remember where we talked about how the bayous got really silty? Look at all that wind pushing directly into there. Churning up that fine silt bottom. Making it muddy as all get out. So right here, this is Dolphin Island, Isle of Herb, Cat Island, Murder Point, Bayou Lafouche. There's no fish in Bayou Lafouche. Don't go there, ever. No fish on Isle of Herb either. Very <clears throat> bad places. All right, and then right in here we got Bangs Lake. There's never been a fish caught in Bangs Lake. Don't go there either, okay? But what we're looking at now is, let's look at where the wind is, okay? You see how the wind is pushing directly into this? Where do I need to go to be effective to find the clearest possible water in these areas? I need to be on the leeward side. So if I'm fishing right up to here, I'm gonna come up in here on the opposite side of Isla Fouche and I'm gonna be looking Sweet, right in on these cuts. So I can concentrate on that. But remember we talked about the moderating influence of the Gulf at this point? I'm gonna do my best to work from the outside, close to the Gulf as possible, and work my way inward, okay? So that's some stuff to go back to. Let's go back to Google Maps real quick, and let's go look at the causeway. Now the causeway comes up all the time. The causeway is one of those places that it's either it's on fire or it's dead as an end. But there's reasons for it. Okay, and if we help figure this out, then you can understand why sometimes it's an amazing place to fish and sometimes it's really tough. Okay? Alright, sweet. Would you put me on satellite imagery, please, sir? Beautiful. Alright, cool. So what we have a couple things going on. We have the Appalachian River coming down into the Blakely River and the Tensaw River right through here. Uh, we got Chocolate Bay, and then right around here from Polecat Bay, we have the influence of the Ten Tom area. The Ten Tom Big B area, right through there, has a tremendous amount of shipping pressure that's stretched out. It's going to be generally fairly muddy coming down through here because they are literally trying to dump as much water through there as possible for shipping. They're trying to try to keep people working and keep people in jobs. I get it, but that's for a whole other story. Will from Bay Keepers will be here uh, probably in the next event and talk about things we can do to help with that. But that being said, now let's take a look at some very productive flats out here. Right in through here, 
right down here on the bottom of I-10. How many times have you driven past and thought to yourself, man, that looks super fishy? It is. But not all the time you might think so. If we go out there right this minute, the algae is so thick, the vegetation is so thick on the causeway. Are there redfish out there right now? Yes. But Peter, you said that salinity wasn't right. You're right. I did say that. But there's places we can look for on the causeway that we can find these redfish. Okay? What do we look for on the causeway? That, that Remember what I talked about after we get past six feet, that salinity picks up tremendously because salt water is heavier than fresh water. So let's look by the main river areas, the flats that are adjacent to main river areas. Can we go down here real quick? Down around? Beautiful. Okay. So if we're coming down here, down Blakely Bar, right through here, you have Turtle Ditch coming through here, and you have this flat, these two flats right here adjacent. Okay, we have that deeper area where in that 12 feet deep, 12 to 18 feet deep through here, and Turtle Ditch is also going to be around 8 to 12 feet deep as well, depending on tide side. Okay, what happens is we have fish that are down there in those rivers. They're going to come up on those flats when the tide is right, and they get in there, and they're going to be feeding on juvenile blue crab, juvenile shrimp, finger molt, the whole nine yards. They're not going to spend all day up there. They're going to dip back down into that saltier water, get that salt soaked back in, and then they're going to come up and pop up again. Now, one thing I do want to tell you about the causeway, we don't see as many rat rats. We see mostly the large, more mature, mature red fish. And I think the reason, this is my personal opinion, I've got no scientificness to back this up, but I feel like those fish can handle coming out of that salinity and being in that fresher water longer. Okay. So, things to remember, if we have higher salt as opposed to lower salt in our bay, the redfish we'll find in the lower salt will be bigger in general. The higher salt area will have more redfish, but generally they will be smaller. Why? Because they can stay there longer. It's safer for them. Okay. So, we've kind of gone through that. we talked about the different flats, what to look for, why to look for. So, when we fish by the causeway adjacent to deep water. Okay. And we also, we see that wind pushing right up through here. We're going to want to be on that sheltered leeward side. We go to the Mississippi Sound, same deal. Can we go out to uh, West End Dolphin Island real quick on the, uh, Google Maps real quick? <coughs> okay, cool. West End of Dolphin Island, absolutely love this area. This actually has grass flats through here, guys. So it's Patty Boy, so it's more, it's beautiful. If you guys have ever been out there, if you go want to take a, just take the boat out there and take the family, I highly recommend it. I love taking my kids. Right? Beautiful area through here. We have that moderating uh, uh, presence of the Gulf of Mexico. What I don't want to do when I'm fishing here or at Fort Morgan, I do not want a wind coming from the north. Why? Because it's going to stack all those waves up on top of us. So we have that wind coming from the south, pushing to the north. These areas are going to be very protected and very much, and it's also going to be cleaner water, and it's going to be a lot more fun for us to go into it. So we got some basic rules of thumb, okay? Leeward side of the wind, okay? Salinity 18 parts per square unit up, or in adjacent to deep water. Oxygen 80% and up. Okay, if we were to go to, uh, if we were to, go to Mayor State Park, oxygen's actually pretty good. Um, turbidity, five parts per square unit and down. Now, when we get to a place where we're like, okay, well, if we looked at the turbidity over there in Mayor, it's going to say 1,000%, and the, uh, the water temp is going to be 812 degrees. Okay? What I want you guys to remember is something that we're looking at as far as our causeway. That same vegetation that I said was really hard to get a fly through is also going to be helpful because it helps filter out that water. So if you can get into those little flats right there, those really protected areas, you're going to go through, you're like, oh, there's so much vegetation, is there a point to go through here? Yeah, keep pushing as long as your boat will let you get through there. You're really good if you're in a kayak, really good if you're in a skiff, keep pushing through there until you can get to that cleaner water because those vegetation is going to filter that stuff out. Cool. All right, next up, we're going to talk about my most. So now we found those things. We know a basic area where we want to go. Okay, we want to have good oxygen, good turbidity, good salinity. So today, what do we talk about? If we looked at everything today, we're looking at the west end of Dolphin Island, Fort Morgan, Petty Boy Horn. In the fall, we might look at other places. But just going off of that, let's say we went to 
uh, West End Off Nine. What are the three things we need to look for when we get to that flat? Okay. Trinity of a flat. There's three biological indicators that we need to look for. In other words, these are our canaries in the coal mine. When we get out there to a flat and we're maybe we've got now the water is clean enough that we can sight fishing. What do we want to see? Gotcha. Hurry. Right. What do we want to see? We want to see three things. One of the first things I want to see is blue crab. Okay. The next thing I want to see is finger mullet. Okay. Now I've got my food sources in order. Okay. The third thing that I want to see, it will either be stingray or sheep's head. If for some reason I don't see one out of those three, I'll pull through it, but I'm not going to spend. Turn that. I'll pull through it, but I'm not going to spend any additional time past just getting through there to see what's going on. So you might pick up and go to that next flat. These are going to show me if I see that I've got blue crab in there. And I've got mullet in there, I've got plenty of food. And if I've got the stingray, if you're gonna see stingray on a flat, there's redfish there around them somewhere. Guaranteed. If there's sheep's head in there, there's redfish in there. Guaranteed. And if you get really bored and decide that you dislike yourself, try fishing for sheep's head on a flat. You know, it's uh just just try it, you'll love it, I promise. Alright? Alright, so what do we got? We got blue crab, we got we got BC. We got mullet. And then finally we have stingray or sheep set. Okay? One, two, three. And later on we'll do another thing where we talk about how to actually see the is am I looking at mullet or am I looking at redfish? We'll get into that later. That's an adventure into itself. Because I think everybody just started side fishing for redfish. How many of you have thrown at mullet? Maybe a little bit more than what we're talking about, right? Okay, cool. That was good advice Ben gave you though. If you catch that redfish and you let him go, watch him swim. Watch that as watch the way he moves. That was excellent advice. That can be very helpful. Alright, now, finally, wrapping this up because I know people have got places they need to be. And you guys have already been super patient with me. So Sam talked about really cool stuff about how to lay out his flies for the beaches. And I thought that was amazing advice. Stuff I've never thought about. I never would have thought to put on a neon uh, icon tying it to my head. Right? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to grab three flies from over here. here. Yep. Three flies from over here. Same exact fly. This is that Causeway Killer that we, I just put on uh, YouTube. Super simple fly. Just like Sam said. Make it simple. Life's better when things are simple. All right, so what do I want to look for? I want to look for, first off, water clarity. Bottom color. Forage. Yes, I do everything in threes. I'm very sorry. I'm Irish that way. Okay, so water clarity. The clearer my water is, to me, the more I want my fly to be as close to that natural color of what I'm seeing as possible. Uh, Sam and I have had many discussions about flashing or not enough flash, too much flash. I think flash is great in the fly, but it doesn't. It needs to be a flash that matches into what's going on. Every bait fish, every crustacean is going to have that glimmer, but if you get too much tinsel going on, it's going to turn fish off sometimes, unless you're trying to outrun the pump. But when we're throwing for redfish, that's going to be helpful. All right, now, muddier water. I really like a dark color. I like something with some crazy accents on it, and the reason I like it is because these darker colors are the last to disappear in the visible spectrum as it moves down into the water, okay? The more, tur the more turbidity we have in the water, the more it's like going down deeper in the water, okay? And then if I get to a place like I'm on Fort Morgan, which I love Fort Morgan because it's got those nice white seams areas and I can see a redfish from very far away. In Mississippi Sound, the great pumpkin Charlie Brown is a tough critter to see because guess what? He's the exact color of this floor right there. That's the exact color of the bottom out there. So it's an adventure. 
So white bottoms, I like that lighter color fly. This is my personal preference. And the reason I like the lighter color fly is because the forage is lighter color. But if you'll notice, I've got little things that are like what I call hot spots. Little things just to get the attention, okay? okay? I call the J and D, just noticeable difference. Something's gonna get their attention as they're going. All right, so next thing, do, 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 do. and then the fourth. Okay, so we covered clarity, got it? Darker for muddy. Natural for clear. Bottom color. If I'm in that Mississippi sound, yeah, white can be effective. It can be super effective because it just gets their attention. But by and large, instead, this is tied for the Mississippi Sound Causeway. I want that darker bottom because that's what the forage looks like. And again, you'll notice small hot spots. That's my preference. Don't take that as gospel. It just works for me. Okay? And like Sam said earlier, if you've had lots of success on that fly, you're right. It's the correct one. So guys in Louisiana don't care. It's going to be this color no matter what. <laughs> right? And are they right? Yes, they're right. Don't fight them. It works. But this is my rules of thumb that have helped me. Okay? So... Match the, match the basic colors. Match the basic color profile. And then finally the forage. What am I seeing in the way of forage? I had a discussion the other day talking about this fly right here. And what I like about it is, does it look like a shrimp? Kind of. Does it look like uh, a crab when it's flint? Kind of. Does it look like the little gobies that live in the marsh? Yeah, kind of. And that's what I want. I really like those generalist patterns. So my, my saltwater flies I like, if we were talking about trout flies, it would be an Adam's fly. It looks like a bug thing. And that's what I really like too. Okay? Now, we can be a lot more specific. There's nothing wrong. We had Dan's story here from Fly Fish, fly fish in Pensacola, which may be the funniest dude I've ever sat and listened to. Oh, you if you get the chance to fish with Dan, just do it. If you know the reason, then we'll laugh. So it's worth the price of admission. Um, he is big on using bait fish flies. Okay? I'm big on using crustacean flies. Could be just a difference in the fishery. Could I pick up a, a EP minute and have great success with it tomorrow? Sure. No doubt about it. But again, I'm, I'm ingrained in my way. But these have been good things I'm going to look for. Now, we talked about those little blue crab. I'm going to put blue accents on my flies. Not a whole lot because what's the blue crab got? Just little tips. Okay? Now I can do stuff that have more of a, I'll show you guys flies later, that are toads that have a ton of that green and blue. And we're on the causeway, there are blue crab through the roof, and you can't tell me that's not what they're after. We get into the sound, there's some blue crab, but they're also feeding on other stuff. I think it's a lot more gobies and shrimp. Okay? And we get on Fort Morgan, I'm pretty sure they're on White Bay. So hence the same fly. So that's what we look at, match that forage, pick up things that are basic in the profile and have a basic same color profile as what you're throwing out. And I like to just throw something a little whimsical in, whether it's a hot color or something, to help it differentiate from the pack of what you're looking at. But that is how I break down Mobile Bay area in three steps of three steps of three steps. <laughs> you guys got any questions? Hello? I will down the road. Well, okay, cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you all, all so much for coming out today, hanging out in the shop. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for coming out. I learned a ton from you today. I had a great time listening to Dempsey, just like always, and Ben was super informative. So, guys, thank you all so much for coming by the store, and we'll see you on the water. Thank you. Thank you.